Good evening and welcome to this British Library online event as part of our Beethoven season and our season of sound. I'm Katie Hamilton and I'm here in the Beethoven exhibition at the British Library. It's my very great pleasure to be your host for this evening. Tonight's recorded rerun took place at the British Library Knowledge Centre Theatre on the 14th of December 2017 and it was originally conceived and delivered at the Cheltenham Science Festival the same year. It's a wonderful talk in two halves and in the first you're going to hear from Professor of Neuroscience Dr Sir Colin Blakemore who gives us an insight into the power of the senses um, and in particular, of course, the sense of hearing. And then in the second part of the talk, Dame Evelyn Glennie, one of the world's leading percussionists, is going to talk about her experiences of creating music as a deaf person. Unfortunately, Professor Sir Colin can't be with us tonight, but we're very excited to be joined by Dame Evelyn, who's going to be available to answer questions after you've watched the film. So in order to ask your questions, just scroll down below the video, and you'll see a box where you can input your question and submit it. Once we've watched the film, I'll be back on your screens talking to Evelyn and we'll get through as many of your questions as we can by the end of the event. So many thanks again for joining us. Evelyn and myself will be back with you in a little while, but for now, enjoy the film. Um, welcome to this, um, this conversation. Um, as John said, it's a, it's a replay of a discussion that Evelyn and I had at the Cheltenham uh, Science Festival a few months ago. Um, we've got a longer period of time this evening, it's a bit longer. Also, both of us have forgotten what we did then, so this is going to be <laughs> entirely new. <laughs> and uh, I thought that perhaps the best way of setting the scene was to give you a boring lecture, but a very short, boring lecture about, uh, about hearing because uh, there are a few things that you need to understand about hearing in order to grasp the full extent of, uh, of Evelyn's capa capacities um, to respond to sound, to feel sound, essentially without hearing. We'll have a chance to discuss in the conversation what is left of, uh, of Evelyn's hearing. It's, it's not completely gone. No. You, you hear a little, um, but it's quite clear that most of her appreciation of what we would call sound doesn't come through her ears, which is hard to understand, hard to believe. But let me, let me um, perhaps make an analogy. We use the word taste to describe our experiences when we eat food. Um, the implication being that the impressions we're getting are from our tongue. And it feels as if they are. When you taste food, it tastes good, it's in your mouth, and the feelings are in your mouth. But almost all of the sensation is coming from your nose, from smell. And you could tell that by how bad food tastes when you've got a cold or something that blocks the circulation of um, air up into the nasal cavity. So we're not necessarily good at knowing where our sensations come from. So we use the word hearing to describe what we hear. But I think that all of us are using other sources of information to understand sounds in the world, sounds and vibrations. And we'll hear more about that from, from Evelyn. It's obvious to all of us that, that our, our senses, vision, hearing, touch, smell, taste, are important to us. They're, they are our way of understanding the world around us. We have these distinct words, vision, hearing, smelling, touching, and so on, which relate to particular sense organs in the body. It's odd that we still, and, and it's not surprising that we use those words because we distinguish the experience of these different sorts of sensation. Um, very distinctly, to hear something, to hear a sound, is, is, is just somehow completely different from having a touch on the skin or, or seeing something. Even though most events in the world generate more than one sensation. If a car drives past you, it makes a noise and you see it. But you can, you can distinguish the seeing of the car from the hearing of the car, even though both of them belong to the car and both of them are part of the overall experience. 
You'd never confuse. Have you ever had the experience driving at night along an unfamiliar, poorly lit road, and you see in the distance something on the road? You look at it, you think, well, could it be a fallen tree? Could it be an animal? Could it be a person? And you adjust your, your behavior, you slow down as you're approaching this thing. Finally, you draw up to it and you, you see what it is. Maybe, maybe a tree that's fallen. But when you are seeing that thing but don't know what it is, you don't know what you're seeing, but you know that you are seeing, you're not at all inclined to say, well, I'm not quite sure whether I'm seeing that thing up on the road or whether I'm hearing that thing up on the road. There's no, there's no um, confusion between one sensory experience and another. Yet, in the last 20, 30 years, psychologists and neuroscientists more and more have found that the, the senses combine in the brain um, and there's enormous cross-talk and interaction between the different senses. I, I showed you this picture from Robert Flood, who was a 16th, 17th century mystic. Um, and he illustrates rather beautifully here um, the notion of the, uh, the, the common sense. It was a, an Aristotelian um, notion originally, that the different sense organs, the, hear, the ears, the eyes, and so on, all send information into a structure in the mind with different components of that structure dedicated to each of the senses. But then, somehow in the mind, this is Aristotle's idea, the things are combined together into a, a common sense. And isn't it interesting we use that phrase, common sense, to mean intelligence? And, um, and in fact, modern, modern brain research suggests very much that our intelligent interpretation of the world is largely driven by, by the the processes of understanding that come through our senses. So it wasn't a bad choice of, of words. Well, in fact, the, um, that, that common sense, as the philosophers saw it, corresponds to very much to how we now see the brain working, combining the different senses. And I just want to show you a, a couple of examples. Have a look at this, um, uh, this man. Watch, watch his lips and listen to what he says. Listen to the sound and watch his lips. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, ba. Now look from one ba, face ba, to the other. Ba, ba. Ba, 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 ba. Do you get any impression that the sound is different, depending which face you looked at? But it's, it's obviously the same sound all the time. You can look from face to face, and the sound seems to change subtly. The movement of the lips uh, somehow modifies the way in which you interpret the, the sound. I mean, that makes eminent sense. We are all lip reading when we speak to other people who are close enough to see. And the kind of lip reading that, uh, that evidence capable of doing and, and a visitor in the second row is only a, a very extreme version of something that all of us are doing. We're using the visual information from the movement of the lips to supplement what we're understanding from the sound and the visual information can change our appreciation of the sound. We know where that happens in the brain, it happens in the auditory parts of the, the, uh, of, of the brain. There's a direct interaction between visual information and auditory. Um, I'll give you another example. It, has anyone here been to um, the Fat Duck restaurant? <laughs> no, I have. <laughs> I have. Well, it, this is um, Heston Blumenthal's you know, world famous restaurant, best restaurant in the world, two years running a few years ago. Um, and um, well, I'll, I'll sum up my experience. On the way home, after arriving, uh, I, know, I know Heston quite well, and you'll see why in a minute. So he invited me to go with someone else from my institute. And he said, do you know, you really must arrive by 7.30. And we both thought that was a bit sort of uncivilized for a really fancy dinner, maybe 8.30 or even 9. He says, no, no, you must come at 7.30 because we, we must close by 1.30. 
Yeah, and that's how long it took. We ate until 1.30, yeah. and 19 dishes or something. It's norm normally 14, but he added a few extra ones. <laughs> but one of his signature dishes that he's very well known for is called um, the sound of the sea. The dish on the menu is the sound of the sea. So when this dish is due in the sequence of extraordinary dishes, the waiter or waitress appears and puts a shell in front of each person on the table. Um, and the earphones are disguised, they're inside the shell, but when the food arrives, he tells you to put the earphones in your ears while you're eating this amazing sashimi of seafood, which is laid out on a plate of glass over sand and pebbles. And what you're listening to is seagulls and waves breaking. Uh, and this is not just um, you know, a frivolous game, it's based on research. It's based on research that Heston did with a colleague in Oxford, Charles Spence, showing that the, the taste of the food is changed by different sounds. And that the, not surprisingly, the sound of the sea complements the sound of the taste of seafood and enhances it. Uh, Charles also, I'll stop the seagulls. Charles, <laughs> Charles also did a wonderful experiment for which he won the Ig Nobel Prize. If you, if you know about this wonderful prize, which is given for um, very clever research, which is never going to win a Nobel Prize. Um, and it was for research, I think the paper was called um, uh, The Taste of Crisps is Changed by the Sound of Crunchiness, or something like that. What he did was to play the sound of eating crisps to people who were eating crisps in different stages of sogginess <laughs> when they'd been left, when the pack of Pringles had been left open for different numbers of days. And he found that he could restore the apparent crunchiness of the crisps by playing the sound of crunching as the person was eating them. <laughs> Extraordinary interaction between sound and taste. And I'll show you the last, last example of this these interactions between the senses. This is a beautiful piece of a uh, little clip of a movie uh, made by Archer's Mark, a production company, which is when it was won many, many prizes. It's part of a, a long documentary about the life of John Hull, um, a philosopher, a theologian, poet, uh, who became um, blind quite rapidly in the, I think, the late 1980s. He died just a few years ago. But as he was becoming blind and afterwards, he made an, an auditory uh, account on a tape recorder, on a cassette recorder, a kind of documentary of his, his impressions and experiences. And this, you'll hear the soundtrack on this, is the original recording. That's why the quality of the sound is not very good. But he's describing an experience when he's completely blind now, regretting that he no longer has the impression of space that vision gives you but sudden, suddenly discovering that sound can give you the same experience. Just, let's just watch the clip of movie. If only there could be something equivalent to rain falling inside. So he's just imagining that if he could be surrounded by rain all the time, then he would be able to see, sort of see the world again, but through the different sound um, reflections. Okay, here's the really boring bit, a little tiny bit of, uh, of you know, first year medical student teaching. This is, this, is the, this is what your ear looks like inside. And it's just a, a remarkable contraption, just an amazing piece of evolution. So the sound comes in through your what we call the ear, but the interesting bits are all inside. Sound comes in here. And this is a, something I want to, to emphasize. I mean, all of us who can hear, and, and some of us who can't hear, have a very rich experience 
from the vibrations in the, in the air around us, which is sound. Sound is simply a pattern of vibration of air molecules striking the ears or striking the skin, moving through furniture or through the floor or whatever. It's just vibrations. But, but everything that enters the ear is a single stream in time of these patterns of vibration. Uh, there's one line of information entering through the ear at any moment, um, and it runs continuously in time. But contrast that, the fact that all of your... It's not like the eye, where there's a real image in your eye, lots of different positions and places and brightnesses and colours. The ear has one, one single line of information over time coming in. These vibrating uh, waves of... of, uh, of air molecules. And from that we gain all of our sound appreciation. We distinguish different people, different voices, the sounds of objects and movements in the world around us. Listen to a symphony orchestra and, and each instrument is in a different position, a different distinct sound. Go to a, a party with lots of people speaking and you can, you can watch the person in front of you that you're talking to but you can be secretly listening to a conversation that's going on somewhere else in the room. We can, it's as if we have that soundscape around us and we can pick and choose what we listen to. We can distinguish all the different sorts of sounds. But all of that information just comes in as this one single stream of vibrations into your ear. It's the brain, of course, which is doing that process of taking them apart. And I'd like to talk to Evelyn late a little bit about whether she can still do that kind of dissection of different sounds. Okay, so the sound comes in, goes down the, the ear canal and hits the eardrum. And inside, beyond the eardrum, is this amazing uh, little articulating collection of three tiny bones which essentially amplify the pressure, increase the pressure at this point here where the the third of the bones pushes in and out, following the same pattern as the sound waves which are hitting it. The sound comes here carrying all the information about voices and traffic and people and instruments and everything. Hits here, gets transmitted through here, hits here on another window, another membrane, which connects to this thing. And this is a sort of snail-shaped structure deep inside the eye called the cochlea. It's three centimetres long. Uh, but it's wrapped up in a coil, um, so it's much smaller than that. It's less than a centimetre in, 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 uh, in diameter. And the, the, real, uh, the, the, the real workings of hearing are inside here. Some 30,000 little specialised nerve endings that respond to vibration. So here it is, stretched out. This is the thing that's coiled up, but if we imagine it pulled out, the sound pressure waves go in here, and they, there's fluid inside. And the fluid communicates with another window here, which can go in and out. So as the, as the sound pressure waves hit this point, they move the fluid backwards and forwards through the tube, following exactly the same temporal pattern, time pattern. So the vibrations are transmitted into the, the column of fluid. But because the structure of this part, these are the, the hair cells along here, the thousands of sensitive endings, because of the shape of this membrane between the two compartments, it, it narrows towards the top. Different frequencies of sound cause movement of the membrane in different positions. So a very low frequency sound causes all of the membrane to flap backwards and forwards. But a high frequency sound causes only this bit to move. The sound, the, the fluid movement transmits through the membrane in this region alone. So, different parts of this structure respond and vibrate most to different frequencies of sound. And that's the basis of how we distinguish everything. Distinguish voices, distinguish musical instruments, and so on. This is a cross-section through that, in reality, showing these little sensitive hair cells and the different chambers with fluid inside them. Right, so now, could we have the lights up in the theatre? Um, I want to ask for your help. Could we have the lights on, on the audience and, and the projector off? Is that possible? Or not? If you turn the projector off, will it still 
keep the trans translate. That's, that's good. Fine. Excellent. Okay. So now, if I can go over here, I hope this is going to work. I'd like you all to um, help me with a, uh, a little test of your hearing. Um, now, looking around the audience, we're a bit too uniform in age for this <laughs> to be really convincing. But no, no, we've got, we've got some younger people. That's great. What, um, all right. What I want you to do is to put, I'm going to play you sounds. I'm going to play you a continuous sound which is changing in frequency. It goes from very low frequency, incredibly low frequency, up to higher and higher and higher frequency. It takes a minute or two. Um, while, it, uh, it, while it's running, I'd like you to hold your hand up if you can hear it. And be honest, put your hand down when you can't. OK? So all, all of you. And just look around the room to see who is still hearing it at the end. OK? Here we go. Um, let me just expand the view. You, you can, you're going to be seeing the, the pattern. If we can have the projector back on, you're going to be seeing the pattern of sound here. And you can see the, the frequency of the sound. Hertz, it means cycles per second. So the, the, it begins with a, a sound pressure wave which is vibrating 25 times a second. Very, very low. Right? And you might be, some of you might be able to hear even that. Here we go. Remember, hands up if you can hear it and keep them up. Put them down when you can't. Good. Good, you're all, that's very good. 39, 40 hertz, excellent. Some just coming in now. Yes. Well, that's, well I can, fit, I can hear, feel it the same way you are. Keep your hands up for as long as you, you can hear it. And you can see the frequency of the sound there. We're getting close to the most sensitive part of your hearing. That's why it sounds loud. Some hands going down. Look around you. Whose hands are still up? Look, you see? Believe it or not, there's still hands up there going. And, and would you say there was an age factor there in <laughs> the hands that were last up? <laughs> exactly. So can we get rid of that? So, in other words, our um, hearing... Now, can we go back to the, the PowerPoint? <laughs> so, this, what this, di this graph shows is an audiogram. It describes exactly just what you've just gone through. It's, it's showing the, the um, amount of energy, the loudness, if you like, of the sound needed to detect it as a function of the frequency of the sound. Remember, all of you were hearing down here, even 30 hertz or so, well, you need a, a strong sound to be able to, but you can hear. Even, the human ear can hear even down at those frequencies. But you need less and less um, intensity as, as you reach the peak of your hearing at about 2 to 4 kilohertz, 1,000 cycles. And then it cuts off very suddenly as you go up. And this high-frequency limit changes with age. We, we lose some of the hair cells in our ear. They become damaged, and it gradually regresses. Some of you were, were cutting out around 6 kilohertz or so. I'm about 8 kilohertz for the moment. Um, it, it varies with, uh, with, with age. Different animals have different ranges of hearing. So bats, for instance, and even mice can hear far beyond hu the human hearing of, of even a young child, up to close to a, a, a 100 um, kilohertz. And uh, fish, dolphins, pigeons, whales can hear sounds much lower than we can hear. So a, a pigeon flying, and, and the sensitivity is very high, and very low frequency vibrations, very low frequency vibrations of the sound in the, in the air, sounds that are produced, for instance, um, it, by storm activity, big storms or aircraft um, travel over huge distances. 
So a pigeon, I calculated that a pigeon in the Rocky Mountains, the States, could have heard the sonic boom of Concord crossing the Atlantic, which, is very, which has a very low frequency component. So birds, some birds are very sensitive to low frequency sound. So our, our, our appreciation of the world is limited by the capacity of our, of our sense organs. I just want to finish the lecture by saying that um, just like taste, and just like those other interactions between the senses that I described, our ears are not the only way that we can understand and appreciate vibrations in the world around us. The ears are very good for sound, for air-based vibration. But vibrations are transmitted through everything, from, from the stage we're standing on. Evelyn was able to detect the sounds, if you were watching her, up to reasonably high frequencies um, without, without normal hearing. So we're able to, to appreciate sounds in other ways. Um, and that's, that's done through a variety of other receptors in our body. If you look at a piece of skin, there's a hair follicle here. There are lots of different nerve endings in the skin responsible for different kinds of sensation, uh, pain and temperature, but also mechanical stimulation of many different sorts. Uh, and these... Um, Funny things down here, deeper in the skin, called Pacinian corpuscles, are incredibly sensitive to high-frequency uh, vibration. They can detect movement of less than one thousandth of a millimeter movement in the, in the skin. And these things are scattered through the whole of the, uh, the body. There are also receptors in our muscles and our joints, all of which are sending information that we're not really aware of. Norm most of us who have hearing are not acutely aware of yet they must be contributing to our understanding of vibrations in the world around us. So, that's my little lecture. Uh, no, yes, just to finish, this is like an audiogram, but it's nothing to do with the ear. This is a description of the sensitivity of human beings to vibration transmitted through the body. So again, it shows the amount of energy needed to detect vibrations as a function of the frequency of the vibration. And you can see the same basic sort of shape, there's maximum sensitivity around about 8,000 hertz, but it goes up to 100 kilohertz, the level of hearing of hearing of a bat. And it goes down way below 20 hertz, or the sort of normal limit of hearing, down to as, as little as a, a tenth of a cycle of movement. So we're actually much more sensitive, the range of vibrations that we can detect through our body is wider than the range of sounds that we can detect through our ears. But most of us are unaware of that capacity. We have it, it doesn't normally invade consciousness fully, um, and we think that all of our experience of vibration is coming from, from our ears. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Can we turn the, this off now then so it makes the, yes, it's the comedy better. So, so there's my lecture, sorry to have taken so long. Um, it's amazing. Now, um, we're going to hear from, from, from Evelyn. I have a, a question before yes, we, we get into a conversation. Is there a type of animal whereby the, their hearing actually improves Is rather than deteriorates? So, for example, with a bat that relies very much on vibration, yes. does their hearing actually improve with age? Oh, goodness. I doubt it because the, the, the change with age is caused by a gradual loss of those little sensitive uh, nerve endings. Mm -hmm. And improvement would imply that you've got more of them, but that doesn't happen. Okay. So I think the only way down, uh, the only way is down. <laughs> okay, say, right. <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, yeah, but the, uh, you know, the ability, of, of course bats live short lives, yeah. so they don't suffer from the kinds of problems associated with old age in, in, in humans, at least not in quite the same, mm. same way. Mm. Mm. But they have to have specialised areas in their brain to understand the kinds of information that come from those very high frequencies. And they, you know, bats use reflections of sound, mm -hmm. like a kind of radar system, mm -hmm. um, to fly in the dark. And, and, and they, have, they must have some kind of impression of the world, mm. almost comparable to vision. It's, it's hard to know what it's like. In fact, there's a, a classic philosophical paper, much cited philosophical ar article mm. called What It's Like to Be a Bat, oh. where Thomas Nagel 
considers this question, we, can, we know what bats can do, we can look at their behavior, but we can never understand what it must be like mm. to be capable of seeing with sound, mm. which is essentially what they must be doing. Mm. Mm. So, over to you, Evelyn. I wanted to start because I'm quite sure that the audience will be as interested as I was when we first discussed this, to know about how it, how it happened. Tell us your story. Of, of, you had normal hearing when you were very young. Absolutely. Um, basically, I was brought up on a farm, and, uh, and so you can imagine the, the type of sound world that I was exposed to, um, that combination between nature, uh, growing up with animals and also machinery, and the responsibility that you had with that soundscape in a way. And I think that's really important because um, when you're in that type of environment, you have an ownership really of the sound. Um, because if your parents are allowing you to be, you know, next to machinery or, uh, or next to livestock or whatever, you know, you're very, very sensitive to what is right there in front of you. So actually your senses are pretty razor sharp, even although you're not thinking that that's the case, um, but it is the case. And, uh, and with that sense of responsibility um, that you're allowed and free to have, um, it's amazing how, in fact, all of the senses become, in a way, this mysterious sixth sense. So there's that sort of patience, I think, in that type of environment um, that allows you to, I suppose, listen to the senses. So for me, I found that from about, uh, well, when I was at, at the age of six, I had mumps. And really from the age of eight, I began to have real problems with very sore ears. So whenever I went outside, um, especially if it was windy and things like that, that, my ears would just really thump, thump, thump. They're really sore. And, uh, and of course, you know, my parents, they, they said, oh, you're OK, you're fine, you know, and it took them ages to uh, get me to the doctor and so on. Until eventually the school noticed that um, there seemed to be a, a difference in the way that I seemed to be in the class. I was more isolated. But bear in mind that I went to a primary school whereby the whole school consisted of 37 pupils and two teachers. So it was very easy for the teachers to tap in, two teachers, by the way, at the, at the school but to tap into each individual. So they were very aware of the subtle, subtle differences that were happening. For me at that age, at the age of eight, I was not thinking, oh, I'm losing my hearing and things like that. It was just a, a real bother to have um, this, this kind of pain coming through. So um, eventually, um, uh, we, well, I think on a yearly basis, we had an audiologist come in. And in those days, it was a case of feeding uh, sounds through the ears and you had to move a counter um, if you heard that. And um, apparently, I didn't do well at all um, in those particular tests. And um, so she then referred me to um, an audiologist um, in, in uh, Aberdeen. So, and that was really the beginning of getting more tests and, and really thinking, wow, well, what actually is happening? And for me, I think the, 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 the changes were that less sounds were coming through the ears, but those sounds that were sort of disappearing were being replaced by blobs of sound, waves of sound, or sounds that I could no longer really distinguish. So if someone spoke, I wouldn't always be quick at picking up who might be speaking or what direction the sound was coming from. So I found that really this, the sense of sight became so crucial. Um, things like um, just, just you know, falling behind with, with schoolwork and things like that because it was such a conscious effort to pay attention, really, um, to, to observe and absorb that information um, and get that message. 
and then act on that. And so I found that I became more and more isolated. And of course, at that time, I was playing the piano. And, and that was my savior, quite frankly, um, because it meant that I was on my own, which I enjoyed. Um, but also, I was then exposed to this uh, sound landscape that was full of resonance and for those of you who you know do play the piano or are, are next to a piano you understand that first of all the body is in a really good posture but but also you know it's just this wide variety of of, um, of vibration that's coming through and I was realizing that actually you know, being connected with that sound was really important and I was able to control that, whereas I wasn't able to control all the sound environments if I went outside or if I went into the playing field at school and so on. So until eventually at the age of um, 12, I was get, kitted out with hearing aids and um, what we called a phonic ear in those days. This is old fashioned uh, technology now, but where it was basically a box that I would wear and the teacher would wear so that the teacher um, had the freedom to walk around the, the classroom to, to give his or her um, uh, lecture or whatever it may be. And uh, however, I started and was introduced to percussion from the age of 12. And this had nothing to do with my hearing because I hadn't come across percussion before that age. It was just the curiosity of seeing the variety of instruments. And, uh, and I was really, really intrigued by that until eventually all first year students at the secondary school had to have a, an oral, a musical oral test. And I did extremely badly in that. And of course, the assumption was that I was unmusical. So I was sort of bottom at the li of the list, um, whilst other ones who did a lot better were given the, the opportunity to start playing instruments. And I said, well, look, you know, I, I feel so passionate inside about music. Um, I do play the piano and I was getting through the grades pretty quickly. Um, you know, please just, just give me this chance. So, you know, after a, a, a few months, eventually I did get the opportunity. And it's just one of those situations where as soon as you, you pick something up or you, you just, the chemistry is there. Um, and that is a form of, of listening as well. It really is. It's just as though those sticks were an extension of the, the limbs. So I was not exploring sound at that point in time. It was just literally that the feeling of the tool um, in your, your hand there and the feeling that that body was absolutely, you know, in, in the perfect posture to uh, perceive sound, really. So that, that was it. And... From the age of 12, I had a, a very good, which was unusual in those days, a very good peripatetic percussion teacher. And uh, his name was Ron Forbes. And in those days, a lot of the percussion teachers were self-taught drummers. And although very, very well-meaning, it meant that they didn't necessarily know about timpani or kettle drums or the mallet percussion and, and the auxiliary percussion such as bass drums and cymbals and castanets and tambourines and whatever. So, but this particular man did. And what was so interesting about him was that he did not allow us to specialize in one particular instrument. So a lot of the, the young lads wanted to play drums, but were not necessarily interested in the xylophone or whatever. So he made sure, and his, his whole thinking was that, well, no matter whether you're introduced to percussion or a tuba or the voice or a paper and comb or an accordion, the, the key thing that links everything like that is sound, is sound. So that's it. So whether I play percussion or I sing or play the piano, I'm creating sound and making this sound meal um, for our, our customers. So it was very important to tap into what he was about. He basically saw all of his pupils as being sound creators first and foremost. And in order to do that, you have to have some understanding of the structure of music, a, stru a musical sentence, as it were, and see that sort of musical story when you're reading a score. You know, we read a book, well, we read a score. And, uh, and, but in order to do that, you need tools. So in my case, it happened to be percussion. So rather than most teachers saying, well, we want you to be a really good percussionist or a really good violinist or pianist or whatever, he was saying, well, what is your sound? 
And so that changed really the whole approach to how I thought about sound. But what he did, because I was fighting with the fact that a lot of sound through the hearing aids was coming through here, and that was really overload. So I felt inside, I was actually fairly sensitive as a musician, and I understood about the musical uh, structure and so on, but I couldn't get that in lined up or in place or projected because of this enormous kind of barrage of and waves of sound that was coming through the ears because the, the hearing aids were amplifying everything. So he, and he found that I was just sort of bang, bang, banging and just playing when I wanted and not listening to other people and so on because I was, I was trying to listen to myself and this was really affecting my sense of dynamics, my sense of touch, my balance, all sorts of things. And the less I heard something, the more sound I tried to give it. So basically, he said one day during a lesson, Evelyn, take your hearing aids off, which I did. And he said, he, he struck a, a, a timpani and he said, Evelyn, can you actually feel, physically feel this drum? And he asked me to put my hands on the, on the wall of the room. So I did that. And I said, yes, yes, I can. I can feel that. So he then lessened the interval of the two drums that he had there, bit by bit by bit by bit by bit. And the subtlety in, in the differences was amazing, but it went from, you know, feeling it from, let's say, I'm just saying now, here to here, to then here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here, and so on. But my listening was suddenly magnified unbelievably, and I had that real patience to pay attention to the beginning, the middle, and the end of the sound, rather than just the impact of that sound. So as listeners, we're often affected by the impact only of that sound, but the resonance of the sound is where we just it makes a difference between one interpretation and another interpretation. So basically, it was about listening to the room, and that became my instrument. Not the drum, not the timpani, not the cymbal, the room became my instrument. So how was I going to paint that sound and allow that sound to have its own natural journey in accordance with the acoustics of the room? So what it did was that it suddenly, well not suddenly, but gradually really allowed me to, to pay attention to the sense of touch, to the sound color, because very often when you start percussion, well, loud is in the middle and soft is always at the edge. And, you know, those are the two basic colors, sound colors that you get. But that, that was just, that didn't mean anything to me now because I also knew that I could play loud at the edge. So what kind of sound color is that? Is it a thin loud? Is it a spooky loud? Is it a sharp loud? You know, is it a threatening loud? Suddenly all all of the dynamics became, you know, really interesting as opposed to just loud, you know, and um, they, they had a, a description to them. And this really allowed me to paint pictures, as it were, with the, 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 the tools that I had. It was almost like cooking or baking or something like that um, with, with really the tools I had. And it was a massive, massive, I mean, I'm so grateful for this particular teacher because if I had someone who stuck to, well, it's always done like this, it's always done like that, then I may be a, a very different player or maybe not here at all. Um, but what he did do was that in my first lesson was that rather than open up tutor book one for snare drum or xylophone or whatever it is, he, the first lesson was, Evelyn, take, take the snare drum away and I'll see you next week. And so you can imagine, you know, as a 12 year old, the, the slight confusion, you know, of, of being in that uh, situation. And uh, so, but with the drum, there were no sticks and no stand. It was literally the snare drum. And the only thing I knew about the snare drum was that it was called a snare drum or a side drum. So I got home and my parents asked, well, what have you got there? And I said, well, it's a snare drum or a side drum. 
And they said, well, what are you going to do with that? And I said, I haven't a clue what I'm going to do with this. I don't know anything about this and I've got nothing to play, play it with and, and so on. As the week progressed, I suddenly thought, well, I do have something to play it with. I've got me, you know, my imagination. I have limbs, I can use these. And so off I went, I started tapping it and scraping it and all sorts of things like that. But what I discovered was that if I put it on, a, on, on the floor, um, it, it sounded like whatever. If I plopped it on a bale of straw, it changed the sound. If I popped it on a pile of, of stones, it changed again, or on the grass or whatever, on a cushion or on my bed, whatever. And the drum changed, it changed. And I thought, that's really interesting, actually. This was no longer just a drum that creates a sound with the dynamics. This is a drum that's got all sorts of inflections here, all sorts of little colours here that I can manipulate if I look deeper into that drum rather than only the surface of the drum. So basically, um, the following week, he asked me how, how I got on and I said, I haven't a clue. And he said, Evelyn, please create the feel of a tractor, he knew I was a farmer's daughter. So I thought, feel of a tractor. So what are we talking about here? Are we talking about a brand new spanking shiny tractor? Are we talking about an old rickety tractor? Are we talking about a tractor with this engine off? Are we talking about a tractor going up a hill or pulling a cart? What are we talking about? You know, suddenly in my head, I had a whole orchestra of tractors there. And it was my choice as regards to how I would create the feel of a tractor. So not the sound of a tractor, but the feel of a tractor. So you can imagine a chug, 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 or the brrrr, or the stationary tractor. So no sound. So it was my choice. So you can imagine that you're never going to open up a tutor book one saying, well, please create the feel of a tractor. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. So what you will find with, with uh, perhaps a tutor book one is, is the situation of um, please, you know, stand with your feet slightly apart. Please hold your sticks whereby they're more or less in a V shape. Please make sure that your arm is at a more or less 90 degree angle. Please make sure there's a little bit of space here between your arm and your body. And if you want to strike the drum, just go off a little from the center there if you want to play loud. And if you want to play very soft, then go, go to the edge. So you can imagine if this was the case in that first lesson and I would strike the drum and I'd probably look at the teacher saying, is that right? Is it that correct? Is that good? You know, asking permission all the time. So you can see the difference there. And, and that really had a, and has had a massive impact on, on how I deal with, with an object and how I look at a room. I mean, as soon as I walked in here, I noticed the raked, the raked um, seating here. I noticed all of the cushioned seats there, the low ceiling, the wooden stage. So I thought I might be all right, but you might have a very different experience to what I'm experiencing. So I may feel a lot more being on this wooden stage than you might be sitting on the, the, the nice comfy cushioned chairs. Those of you sitting in the front row will have a very different experience than those of you sitting in, in, in the back rows and so on. What are your moods? What's been going on in your day today? How are you sitting? You know, it goes on and on and on and on. So my job isn't to make you feel this or feel that. That's your responsibility, it really is. But my job is to give you this kind of sound meal whereby you can then take ownership of that and deal with it as you wish. So, and each performance that happens means that you're you're in a way giving a world premiere all of the time, even although you're playing the same piece maybe a hundred times in your career, even more. Each time it's like a world premiere because I won't have played it in here, in this particular room. I won't necessarily have played it in front of you. So your presence is making it a, a, a premiere. So, so anyway, that was that. <laughs> Dame Evelyn Glennie there with Professor of Neuroscience Colin Blakemore.
um, filmed here at the British Library in 2017. And we're absolutely delighted that Evelyn's able to join us this evening. Evelyn, lovely to see you. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure. And um, just to remind everybody at home um, that you're very welcome to put your questions uh, to Evelyn if there are things that you'd like to ask her either about the film that you've just watched or as we start to chat now, all you have to do is scroll down towards the bottom of your screen, type in your question and hit submit and it will pop up on my screen here and then we can add it into the conversation. Um, so Evelyn, I'm sitting here in, in the British Library in the middle of the Beethoven exhibition. Um, and one of the most striking things that we've got as part of this really wonderful collection of manuscripts and diaries, there's a tuning fork that um, was reputed to belong to Beethoven and various other things, is a device that allows uh, people who come to the exhibition to experience in a very physical way the same sorts of things that you were discussing in that film of you know, it, the embodied sound. Um, of music, namely a, a bone conductor that we have at the back here, where you can rest your elbows on a wooden bar and feel the music through your arms um, with your hands over your ears and round your, your skull. And I was really taken by the wonderfully eloquent way that you described the kind of physicality of, of hearing, of listening, as well as of playing. It struck me very much that one of the things that we talk about a lot when we talk about Beethoven and his and his hearing is his isolation, um, his social isolation and the fact that that kind of feeds into the idea of the great creative genius who's disconnected from the rest of the world and other composers talking about um, the very fact that his hearing was not as other people's meant that he could sort of access different realms and so on. But Obviously, he was a musician. He was an embodied musician, as you are. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, as a percussionist um, and as a pianist, since Beethoven was also a pianist, how do you, you know, do you do you think about the way that somebody like Beethoven might have actually sort of felt the music through their fingertips, as it were, when it came to, for example, playing Beethoven's piano music when you were when you were a teenager? Well, it, it's so fascinating, and, and I think we forget, you know, that uh, Beethoven really did push the boundaries as regards to stretching the senses and the very fact that he did not have the mod cons as we have now with the varieties of hearing aids, cochlear implants, and all sorts of things like that. And, uh, and it's remarkable how he really dug deep as regards to how he could connect the body with his instrument, the piano. And I think although he was losing his hearing, he actually became uh, an extraordinary listener because really this was being fed through a system and he almost became an extension of the piano and the piano became an extension of, of his physical being. And I think it's fascinating that people today can have that opportunity to rest their, their elbows, you know, on a, on a, a, a wooden platform and, and begin to see how the body actually operates. And I'd love for these types of things to be um, used really as educational tools when, when we're at school to really think about the difference between hearing and listening. And uh, because Beethoven, he never stopped listening. Uh, he never uh, tied the, the two elements of hearing and listening together. Listening, in a way, the less he heard medically, the more he experienced through the whole body. So his body really did become like a big ear, like a resonating chamber. It's quite interesting when actually you put your hand over the top of a resonator of a marimba or a xylophone or something and you strike the bar and no matter how hard you strike that bar it will eventually choke itself it will it, it will not give you any more and that is that so it won't give you any more color any more dynamic it just becomes a, a thud but as soon as you remove your hand from that uh, resonator and strike the bar again, the dynamics really spread vertically and horizontally. And I think this is what was happening with Beethoven. Suddenly, the sound that was perhaps being registered through this part of the body and through the ear was that now, you know, really registering in all sorts of directions through his body. It's interesting. He talks about um, 
when he was first having hearing problems in his late twenties, it's quite striking. Some of the language he uses um, is very similar to the experience that, that you seem to have, have had, um, that he says, sometimes I hardly hear people who speak softly. The sound I can hear, it's true, but not the words. And yet if anyone shouts, I can't bear it. This kind of blobbiness, I think you described it as of, of sound. Um, but I, I also really struck by what Colin was saying about um, the, the kind of the visual, the importance of the visual, because we know that in the, for when Beethoven was rehearsing his very last string quartets, um, sort of 1825, 1826, just shortly before he died, he would run rehearsals with the string quartet that were going to be performing them and was, was absolutely kind of eagle-eyed at their bow strokes, at the kind of the, the physical strength and movement that he could see in their arms, their fingers on the fingerboard and so on. And it struck me also that, because he did play the violin, you know, obviously string instruments are pressed against your body in a very direct way that even the piano, even the pianos that he had adapted for him are not so much of a direct physical connection as a string instrument can be. That's that's so true. And, and you know, the thing about deafness is that, yes, it can be extremely isolating and it can be very deceiving as well, because you just imagine deaf people don't hear anything at any time. And that isn't the case at all. And there can be a, an incredible amount of frequencies, actually, that really do stick out. And this can really affect your, your sense of balance and your sensitivity as well. So even putting down a, a cup or a mug or a plate or something on the table, you could quite easily misjudge that um, because you, you can't quite tell what the sound is going to be. And so that sense of, of touch, it's a very strange thing to describe but the eye really plays a part in how much force you put that object on the table. So as a percussion player, as a pianist and so on, and, and really watching any kind of musician, the eye plays so much in what you hear. Mm -hmm. And this is why we don't really enjoy recording so much because there isn't that essential element of seeing the musician play, even before a sound is made, you know, you can get a sense of, of what that sound is going to be with all of the, the pre-physical preparation. And very often if I'm giving uh, classes or master classes or something to, to young players, instantly, as soon as they pick up their mallets and how the limbs move, you can absolutely, nine times out of 10, tell what that sound is going to be. And it's fascinating. And, and I think this is just, again, an example whereby we're all capable of expanding our senses, but also allowing our senses to speak with each other. So building those bridges and entry points as regards to how our senses need each other. So in a way, you know, there are a lot of high sounds. In fact, I'm losing a lot of high sounds, so I can no longer hear a hi-hat, for example. Um, Whereas before I could hear a hi-hat. And so therefore my sense of touch when I play a hi-hat, I'm very aware is, is quite different to how it used to be. So the body is a living thing and our senses are living. It's like a, a, a moving river and we have to pay attention to how they function and what sort of messages they're giving us. And that really has an impact then on physically how we negotiate those instruments. And there is something that seems to me anyway, as a, as a non-percussionist, that of, of all the various um, sort of instrumental groupings that we might encounter, percussionists are such physical creatures, if you like. There's, there's something so kind of choreographic and almost balletic sometimes about the way that you perform. Um, you know, often you see um, per percussionists performing barefoot or in socks so that the whole body is involved and there's a wonderful sense of, um, which I guess is the sort of thing you notice in masterclasses, of kind of freedom and fluidity in the body. If you're watching a percussionist to flow their way around a, um, a group of instruments over the course of a big piece. I think that's true. And, and I think that's partly for, for several reasons. Uh, the instruments come in all shapes and sizes. So sometimes we're negotiating something uh, that is very long and, and uh, it could be at waist height. The next minute we, we could have our arms up above our head, such as playing tubular bells or, or um, a multi-percussion setup, or we can be in all sorts of different positions, but also that the, our sound comes from our body weight. 
and our sound really comes from our big toe. You know, it's so important to be well and truly balanced and planted on the floor and allowing almost your feet to be like an elephant, you know, so you have this great big specimen, but actually the delicacy of the, the, the feet and how they speak to the rest of the body is absolutely crucial. So it, it, this fluidity, I think comes very naturally for percussion players. Um, and we also feel as though we're, we're painting sound because there is such a lot of movement can be, but we do need to be careful that any kind of movement we make, that the quality of the sound makes sense because we have to allow the sound to stand on its own feet um, because we're not always going to have this physical uh, image or, or aid or support and um, so if we're making recordings or something there may not be that uh, part that, that, that feeds the more information so we have to always be sure that you know what we're physically feeling is true to our own physical body and I think with all of the, the devices such as sub packs or um, things that we stand on in order to feel sound or uh, vibrating chairs and one thing or another, they're really interesting. However, the reality of, let's say, feeling glockenspiels or symbols or triangles on the upper part of your body doesn't make sense if you're suddenly feeling them um, through your legs you know which sometimes these devices do and that really affects your your sense of balance and so on it, it's a very very strange thing or if suddenly you're feeling a bass drum um through your scalp um so it, it, it's so important to to relate to the sounds that you're creating according to your own body so i may feel something let's say on my chest or my tummy or wherever but someone else may feel it slightly higher in their neck or on their shoulders wherever it may be and that's absolutely fine um, but there's never usually such a discrepancy whereby we, we may feel a glockenspiel through our feet it must be so disorientating to suddenly find it's coming yes. from the wrong place really yeah. odd um we've we've had a question in from um from emily who um was wondering about the way that you encountered this wonderful story you told about, about being given the snare drum for homework effectively um and she she wonders if if that's how you encountered other instruments as well if your teachers sort of set you other instruments in the same sort of way well i think uh i was allowed to discover put it like that. And this was partly because uh, back in the 80s and or, or rather late 70s, uh, when I started percussion, um, was that our school, you know, didn't have people coming in giving master classes or workshops. We didn't have a uh, repertoire that we could buy from the local music store and things like that. So basically we had to use our imagination um, mm -hmm. as did our teacher. So um, for example, he may have given us a bit of Bach or something, a, a Bach partita, and it might've been in G minor um, or D minor or A major or whatever it might've been. And he would just ask us to take a phrase of that partita and basically it might have just gone and so on. So rhythmically he might have said, right, everyone play that on the snare drum. So well if if you put that on the snare drum, you might think it just goes non-stop. But actually what he was saying is what is the feel of G minor? And when you think about that, you know, G minor is not a massively threatening key. It's almost trying to be threatening, but it isn't really, you, you know, um, not like F sharp minor, which is so rich and, and you, you know, in the dark and things like that. And it, it's, it's quite fascinating because once you understand about the ebbs and flow of seeing the phrasing, on the page so you're kind of sight reading you're deciding what the feel might be you're you're deciding on the sense of touch on that snare drum so suddenly how you're manipulating the sticks in the snare drum goes far beyond what a teacher can actually teach you they're giving you the springboard but then it's up to you to think what does that g minor feel to you you know and it could feel something completely different to someone else and 
each time it can be validated, you know, and that's what's important. And that really delves into your natural giving and natural curiosity as regards to how you want to interpret something at that particular time. And I mean, I know that you're you're very, very passionately committed to education, um, a, a sort of musical education as broadly as possible. So this kind of is this sort of exploratory work with a, a given instrument and set of sonorities something that you do a lot with your teaching and workshops? I, I love this. I think this is a, a, an absolute essential part for young people to explore, for anybody to explore. I mean, this is what we do as musicians. You know, we analyze pieces, but we, we're also um, exploring all of the sound possibilities. And, and we never want to lose that sense of curiosity. So all of the time, even if you think you're playing a one dimensional instrument, such as a snare drum, you know, and you might think, well, that's all about rhythm. You know, how can it possibly play a melody? Um, but actually, when you begin to use different vocabulary and how you're describing sound and how you're describing dynamics, I mean, how many times during our life have we, you know, read or been told P equals piano equals soft, F equals 40 equals loud. What on earth does that mean, you know? And but when you think about, you know, something that's really big and present or something that is really threatening or something that is very majestic, you know, that can be soft or loud, you know, it really can. And so once we begin to explore those sort of things and allowing people to see the instrument as um, multi-layered, as like peeling an onion, you, you know, just looking at the next corner, wondering, well, what would happen if I manipulated like this or that? Then it becomes a really interesting experience and it allows them to think that they have permission to explore their instruments in their own way. That's that's wonderful. And I, I so interesting to hear what you said about language, because, um, you know, obviously the way that we use language can so affect the way that we then experience music or the way that we then think about a composer. And last Beethoven point before we come back, because I'm keen to make sure we get um, audience questions, do keep sending them in um, that, you know, it, it struck me looking through the Beethoven literature ahead of um, this evening. And there's some really wonderful and interesting things that have been written, particularly recently, um, you know, sort of historical medical work being done on what might have caused Beethoven's deafness, but also the various things that were done to try and help him and make, um, you know, adjusted instruments and so on. That when it comes to the narrative of, of somebody like Beethoven, most of what we hear about is the idea of his hearing as a limiting factor that had to be kind of heroically overcome. And actually, it strikes me that it's only really quite recently that the narrative has started to shift in a way that strikes me as far more interesting, which is, you know, firstly, what does it mean to internalize sound and conceive of it in a way that means that you're not entirely dependent on just what you can hear? but also the kind of exactly what you've spoken about, the physicality of listening, the um, adaptation of his, of several different pianos, um, ways of holding instruments against the body. Um, some really interesting research that's been done recently um, by some scientists in the British Medical Journal on the fact that his string quartets, whereas his orchestral music, there is no, there seems to be no evidence that the um, the kind of range of pitches or dynamics or anything is affected as he gets older and gets further through his succession of symphonies, that within his string quartets, precisely the kind of reduction of higher note partials that Colin talks about in the film does seem to happen in the string quartets. And the scientists, they simply observe and they don't try and draw any conclusions from that. But kind of going back to this idea of embodied sound and the violin pressed against your arm and the cello against your chest and so on, um, I, you know, I, I feel like this is actually a far more fruitful and, and human way of connecting to Beethoven as a composer than sort of sticking him up on a, a cloud, um, you know, the great tortured hero sort of thing, that it, it, it humanizes him, but it also reminds us of the kind of the very complex and rich and colorful thing that interaction with, this, with the sound of music, the noise of music, what it actually is. Absolutely. And, and you've just described that so, so wonderfully. And, and, you know, it really does help to open up what we imagine hearing to be and what we imagine 
listening to be. And uh, if we could do this with all of our senses, really, it would give us such a different perspective and a different perspective um, as regards to how we interact with other people who may be going through um, certain uh, challenges in a way whereby they may be hostage to the fact that heavens, I'm losing my hearing. That means I'm not going to be able to do X, Y, or Z. Um, but there is always a way, there's always an entry point um, if we can help each other with how we, we, we interact, whether it, it's through the vocabulary we, we use, the language we use, um, and, and creating a shared experience in a way. Um, but yes, I mean, I know in my own instance, um, I've always been attracted to the low end of the piano. And even as years have gone by, if I'm playing piano duets with my, my pianist, um, you know, he, he just knows I will be sitting on the left hand side. And I just get so much more enjoyment. I'm in much more control when I'm in that area that actually I'm not necessarily hearing as far as the clarity is concerned, but the feeling absolutely. And whereas at the top end, I'm really neither feeling or hearing that makes much sense to me, or it doesn't give me the emotional appeal. So we have to ultimately, you know, find what is it that gives us the emotion? Because if without emotion, we won't be able to tell a story. And yeah. I think that when I'm certainly dealing with people and allowing them to explore the, the sign colors and all the possibilities they can, it's so that they can have all of those sound paint brushes, as it were, uh, to, to create their story. Fantastic, what beautiful images. Um, we've had a, um, a rather more um, kind of up to the minute technological question from, from David, who's asking about um, how it's been the last couple of years being kind of thrown into the Zoom portal um, and, and having to deal with all of these phenomena at a distance and all mediated by technology and what, you know, whether there have been challenges in that and, and also whether there have been sort of unforeseen advantages to it. It's a really important and interesting question um, because for me, and I can only talk about my own situation, is that um, uh, from a musician's point of view, I have gained no satisfaction at all um, from perceiving music through uh, a computer, a laptop, or any means like that. So, however, uh, and, and that's always been the case, so I've never been reliant on any part of that. And um, so it's allowed me really to reconnect with a lot of the instruments um, that I have in the collection. So during uh, the pandemic, I hadn't actually been interested in learning new repertoire or certain pieces of music that I've always wanted to learn. But what I have been doing is actually reconnecting with the instruments and almost going back to step number one, you know, and truly physically feeling without the pressure of having to prepare something for 7.30 on a particular date. Yeah. Um, and that's created a, a, a kind of listening that has been just so wonderful to have the time to digest, to explore and so on. And, and it, it's, it's really made me think I need that time. I need to, to get that time into my schedule as a necessary um, part of my growth, really, um, and a continuation of my curiosity towards what I do as a musician. So that's been, been wonderful. But as far as um, communication is concerned, as we're doing now, it's been absolutely essential. And historically, you know, when people used to write letters, I would write letters to my parents as a student because I couldn't use the phone and most people were telephoning. And but then once fax machines came on the scene, I could then live in, independently. So um, and then once emails came about, then, you know, we were all kind of fairly generic in, in how we communicated. And that now with uh, with um, uh, Skypes and Zooms and Teams and this and that and texting and you name it, you know, we're all really communicating in the same way. Hmm. Really interesting. <laughs> I, so I've got my eye on the clock because I'm conscious that we're, we're, we are nearly out of time, which is very distressing. Um, but I do want, I mean, really, the, the, the question of time seems to be one that a lot of musicians 
uh, sort of mentioned if they sort of popped up on social media during the pandemic that actually the, the opportunity, as you say, without the pressure of the date that's that's around the corner for which you need to prepare X things, then you've got to get on a plane and go to wherever and do the next thing. Um, and we're looking at this fantastic collection of instruments behind you. This is an entirely flippant question just to finish with, but how many percussion instruments, Evelyn, have you actually got? Well, um, I spent the, the lockdown periods um, actually logging every single instrument onto a spreadsheet along with the story of each instrument and the dimensions right. and weights and so on. So we are now a little over 3,500. Wow. So some You're are small, some are big. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still collecting. <laughs> That's absolutely <laughs> wonderful to hear. Um, well, look, unfortunately, we are we are out of time. I feel like we could just chat for hours because there's so many more questions. Thank you for those who sent questions in. Um, huge thanks to um, Professor Sir Colin Blakemore for his wonderful talk and the opportunity to hear it again. And also, Evelyn, of course, to you for joining us this evening um, and to you at home for tuning in. Um, don't forget that the exhibition is open here at the British Library until Sunday the 24th of April, so if you want to come and see those Beethoven artefacts and also try the Bone Conductor just around the corner from me, it's a really wonderful experience and a wonderfully rich collection of items. So thank you for being part of this evening's event for the British Library's Season of Sound and Beethoven season and have a wonderful evening. Good night. <laughs>